Commissioner Cox? Here. Commissioner McCoy? Commissioner Goss? Here. Commissioner Noble? Commissioner Noble? Here. Commissioner Keith? And Commissioner Shores? She's there. Yeah. We have a quorum. All right, everybody um, will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Item number one, consideration of public comments. Those wishing to address the Planning and Zoning Commission need not request permission in advance. Action taken as a result of public comments will be limited to directing staff to study the matter or rescheduling the matter for consideration and decision at a later time pursuant to ARS 38-431. All righty, item number A, public comment process. Residents wishing to commit, commit must contact the city clerk, Annie Meredith, no later than 9 a.m. on June 3rd, 2020. Comments will be accepted in written and standard audio format. Audio comments must be under three minutes in length and can be submitted to the city clerk by email or by dropping them off to the clerk's office located at 310 North 4th Street. Residents can also watch the council or commission meetings live streamed at YouTube, City of Kingman, or Cable Channel 4. Has any comments been submitted, Ann? No, sir. All right, thank you. Item number two, <clears throat> a public meeting on a zoning ordinance update. The consultant for the Kingman zoning ordinance update, Lisa Weiss Consulting Incorporated, will provide a presentation to the Kingman Planning and Zoning Commission the presentation will cover the current process, progress on the zoning ordinance update, including overview of the administrative draft, a discussion on legal issues in regards to signs, and an overview of form-based codes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Roger Eastman here with Lisa Weiss Consulting. Just want to confirm, can you all hear me and see the screen? Yes. 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 Very good, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you on this rather toasty afternoon. Again, I'm Roger Eastman, director with Lisa Weiss Consulting. We've been working with your city staff now for a little over a year. Um, and really excited at this opportunity to spend some time with you for the next, I'm not sure how long we're gonna go, hour and a half, two hours perhaps. And what we'd like to do uh, today is really just talk a little bit about why are we here uh, to introduce Lisa Weiss Consulting and uh, just talk a little bit about our firm, introduce the zoning ordinance update, and then I'll hand off to Adam in our office and Adam will give you an overview of the administrative draft zoning code. At some point after that, I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, we um, pause and uh, entertain any questions from the Planning Commission on the administrative draft. Um, I will then lead off with a discussion about that very important US Supreme Court case, Reed v. Town of Gilbert, uh, the 2015 case that has a big implication for your sign code. Um, we'll answer any questions from you, I would suggest, after that. And then a similar presentation to the one we did back in September, an introduction to form-based codes. So why are we here? Well, we responded uh, to an RFP that was issued in December of 2018. 
And the RFP asked for a, quote, state-of-the-art, modern, comprehensive, legally defensible, user-friendly zoning ordinance. And we were very fortunate through the interview process to be selected uh, to provide the work for the city of Kingman. Contract was approved in June of last year, and we started the work in earnest with city staff in July. So who is Lisa Weiss Consulting? Well, Lisa Weiss is a CPA turned planner, um, acknowledged now in the planning profession, both nationally and in the state of California where the company is based. And Lisa brings her economic CPA background with planning to our work. And we found a useful way of integrating those two skills, even though planning is really our bread and butter work and we do a lot of zoning codes and specific plans and a lot of housing policy in California, we integrate a lot of the economics work into our practice. And while we're a small firm, mostly headquartered in San, in, headquartered in San Luis Obispo with smaller offices in San Francisco and LA, I'm the satellite office, if you like, in, in Sedona, we are a small firm, but as you can see here, we've got tremendous depth in the degrees that our staff have. And we've just done a tremendous amount of work in our 14, 15 years in business. And as you can see, we've worked in over 100 cities in the US. Most of that work is in California, somewhere over 60 zoning codes. And we're really pleased to be working in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia now on two different projects. So, why are we updating your zoning ordinance? Well, city staff knows this really well, and I'm sure as you as planning commissioners realize that your code is a little old. Uh, first adopted in 1971, readopted in 2001. Most recent update was in February of last year. And we were really surprised to learn from Sylvia and, and Rich that Text amendments have been made over 290 times with over 500 zone changes. So that really speaks volumes to the Kingman Code just needing some help. And in our audit and recommendations report that we wrote last year, we summarized the code as inconsistent, complicated, confusing, imprecise, disorganized, antiquated, disjointed and unpredictable. And those terms didn't necessarily always come from us. They often came from the stakeholders and the staff that we've interviewed throughout this process. So what we're hoping to do with our code is respond to the RFP and give you an ordinance that is consistent, that's user friendly, it's gonna be well illustrated, it'll be coherent, concise, integrated, engaged with modern practices and zoning, so it'll be innovative, and it'll have predictability. And of course, throughout the process, we'll involve Kingman residents and make sure that the code implements the general plan that, as you know, was most recently adopted. So here's a quick look at the schedule. The kickoff again in July of 2019. In September, we worked on the um, completed rather the zoning ordinance audit and recommendations report, presented that publicly. I remember meeting some of the planning commission members at that meeting. And then since then, we've been working on compiling an admin draft. And we started off with a slightly different process where we were gonna present different sections of the code to staff, but it was starting to get a little bit unwieldy and staff worked with us and agreed that by the end of March, we'd submit a compiled admin draft or administrative draft. They are still wrapping up their review. I expect comments from staff within the next week or a few days. Um, and so here we are in, in June presenting rather unusually an overview of the administrative draft. Typically, this is a document that's just reviewed internally by staff but we've got nothing to hide. It's not complete by any means. It's got typos in it and it's not formatted exactly right. The goal was to get text down for staff to respond to so that when we release the public review draft uh, towards the end of August or into September, it'll be a clean document for the public to now really weigh in on. So that hopefully we'll get comments from you. We're expecting comments from staff soon. As I say, that'll help us 
establish and set up the public draft. And then towards the end of the year and into early next year, we've been a little slower through this compiled admin draft and getting comments back. We anticipate by January or at the latest February adoption by City Council. So at this point, I'm going to hand off to Adam Pisakiewicz in our office. He's actually in the LA office. Adam's been with the firm now as associate for just about a year. He's a, got a five-year planning career. Um, much of his work is in local government as mine as is mine. So he's been a tremendous help in helping me pull together the administrative draft. So I'm going to stop sharing this and hand off to Adam. Okay. Make sure I get this right. Okay. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. Yep. Great. So. Whenever we start this process of updating a zoning code, we always go back to the general plan and see what are the most relevant elements to incorporate into there, uh, particularly as it relates to land use and growth. And we, we pulled this quote from your existing general plan in terms of how we should be guiding ourselves through this process. So a variety of land uses, conserving natural resources, reducing automobile, de automobile dependency, and a uh, logical expansion of infrastructure and service capacities. So we always start with this as the guiding principle and then move forward through the code. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is give you a very high level review of each of the titles within the code and some of their uh, subsequent divisions and sections. So here in front of you, you have uh, the new table of contents uh, juxtaposed to the old one. So uh, the biggest difference here is that we have the title and each subsequent division and section listed in the table of contents. So it truly now is uh, well organized and a one-stop shop for anything that either staff or an applicant uh, would need to know about the code. So everything, every section is in here and it will be very easy for someone to just immediately open the code and know where they need to go in terms of uh, whatever their needs are. So getting into title one, which is title, purpose, and jurisdiction. So um, overall, as I go through this, uh, keep the words consolidation, expansion, and modernized in your head. I know consolidation and expansion are two kind of competing ideas, but here you'll see that we consolidate all of these um, certain elements into one title, and then we expand each of the subsequent uh, sections. So within title one, this is basically the legal basis for the zoning in this city. It has the purpose of the zoning code, the consistency with the general plan, and the overall administrative authority. So right now this section is way more robust than what you have today and provides that necessary legal basis that all zoning codes need. So jumping into title two, which is the administration procedures and enforcement title. Um, Again, this is, this is a really big one in terms of consolidation and expansion. Because uh, in the existing code, uh, these elements are in disparate places throughout the, throughout the document. And here we put them all into this one title. So again, it's a, a one-stop shop for whatever uh, administrative or process information you would need uh, in terms of you know, just simply submitting uh, an application for a site plan. So uh, above all, it'll be much easier for staff to administer and easy for applicants to navigate uh, when looking at this section. So we pulled uh, one screen grab on the right, uh, just as an example page. So you can see in the notice of public hearings, we've now put a table in there uh, to let you know which types of permits need what types of notices and how they need to be posted. So that's a, a huge upgrade from, from what there is today. And then the bullets on the left are just some of the uh, subsequent sections within this title uh, that get covered. So permits and approvals. We've now uh, consolidated and expanded and clarified the site plan review process in there. We have all of the non-conforming provisions in there. So non-conforming buildings, non-conforming lots, all of that is in one section. And then obviously variances, appeals, and enforcement are all in there as well. So it's, it's quite a large section, but it has some of the most relevant information for staff in terms of administering this new code. So it's uh, very, very much a consolidation and a reorganization of the processes and procedures. And then I just wanted to highlight that a little bit further 
uh, with the permits and approvals section here. So we have, as you can see in the screen grab, we have all the types of permits listed there. There's some new ones in there that we're proposing as well. Um, so whenever an applicant needs a permit and they need to know what to do, they just open up to this section and they have all the information they need relative to, to the permit that they need. Okay, uh, jumping into Title Three, which is the zones. So we have all of the uh, zones listed in this and it's uh, broken up by the zone type. So what I mean by that is residential zone, commercial zone, industrial, and then your recreation open space zone as well. So each of these zones has um, a requisite table to the right. So this is just pulled from the residential section, um, but you'll see that we have all the, the zones listed in tables such as this. And then we get into further detail in terms of the types of regulations for each of the zones. So not forgetting the overlays and the planned development zones, um, as you can see here. So one of the, uh, one of the bigger changes that we made um, in developing this draft of the code was to consolidate some of the overlay zones uh, that are in the existing code. So on, on the right hand side, you'll see this image of a uh, Excel spreadsheet that we put together because we wanted to analyze the Bank Street Design Review Overlay District, the Wallapai Mountain Road Area Plan, and the Wallapai Mountain Road Area Plan Overlay District to see where the similarities and differences were. And what we found was that these three different districts are mostly the same. So what we did instead is we consolidated them all into one district with the same standards and call it the Kingman Design Review Overlay. So this clarifies that not only for the, uh, the residents and any applicants that live in these uh, overlay zones, but also for the staff. So they don't have to navigate three different uh, overlay districts. There's just one with uh, the same, similar sets of standards that have since been clarified as well. So that's just one example, and I'll get into a few more examples of the changes that we made. Um, and then we have your historic overlay district zone, the transect overlay zone, which is new, which Roger will uh, discuss later in the presentation. And then we have the two planned development zones, the Hualapai Mountain Medical Center and Kingman Crossing. And I'll uh, speak to some of the changes that we made in there in just a second. So each, uh, each zone type, so uh, residential, commercial, industrial has uh, associated use tables as well. So we just pulled this one from the residential uh, section. It's the multifamily and manufactured home zones. So what we did was, um, so there's one table per zone type and we organized the uses into logical groups. So you can see with uh, recreation, education and assembly as an example. We put all of the rel uh, relevant uses under that section, and then you have each zone and whether it's permitted or conditional use permit. So again, simplified um, and uh, consolidated. Uh, so you can expect to see a, t a use table like this in each of those sections as well. And then along with the use uh, standards, we have the development standards. So similar. Uh, each zone type will have their own development standards table in terms of uh, building height, lot requirements, and then you'll see the other requirements that would normally be in these sections have now been consolidated into the supplemental standards. So the encroachments, the fences, walls, and screening, the landscaping is all in one uh, title now. So anytime you see that in the development standards, it'll refer to that one title. Uh, so again, it uh, reorganizes that section and makes it a much simpler process to navigate in terms of getting the correct development standards for the, the type of development that you wanna do. So here, I'm just gonna quickly go over some of the changes that we made. Um, we created a new uh, single family zone, the R15A. Um, we combined uh, the R18 and R16 to just have one zone because they were very, very similar to one, one another. Uh, we removed the RMH8 and RMH10. We removed the residential factory built zone. And then we changed the uh, planned development uh, district to planned development zones. So um, the PDs uh, as a use type essentially are, they're, they're no longer just a use permit as they are today. Uh, planned development uh, zones are a legislative act that need to be approved by the city council. They amount to a zone change, which always needs to be approved by the city council. So we've clarified 
the thresholds that are needed to, um, to rezone to a planned development zone. So now the minimum is uh, roughly 20 acres. And uh, what this is intended for is for large sites that can't handle the regulations on the under underlying zoning. And the best example for any planned development is uh, a hospital. A hospital really can't conform to, let's say it's in a residential zone, it can't conform to the same residential standards that are there. So it needs its own. And that's when a planned development zone comes into play. So we've further clarified that process um, and to make it uh, the legislative act that it is. And then, as I mentioned before, we combined the, th uh, the three different, uh, the Ball Pine Mountain Road overlay, the road area plan, and then the Bank Street um, into the Kingman uh, design review overlay. So those are just some of the major changes that we made. Overall, nothing uh, too, too major, but it definitely simplifies and clarifies um, from what you have before. So then uh, the last section within the zones is the specific to uses. Uh, so we've consolidated all of these uses into one section and expanded and modernized their criteria. Um, so on the right is just an example of the table of contents for this section. You can see some of the uses that we cover here. And then we pulled out uh, on the bullets on the left, uh, just some of the, the bigger ones um, that we have since uh, modernized uh, its uses, making sure it complies with state law and also um, just making sure that it can be effective in their use, such as ADUs. And then we get to Title IV, which is uh, the supplemental standards. So this is where we keep um, all of the associated standards that any development has, like parking, um, landscaping, outdoor lighting. All of these are consolidated now into this one supplemental standards section. So we pulled out a page um, for the parking standards, uh, just as an example to show you. So um, you'll see that uh, just as we saw in the, uh, the zones where we have the uses listed, those use, uses match the uses listed in the parking section. So you'll be able to see what use you have, and then you'll flip to this parking table and know exactly what your parking requirement is. So all these tables will have a vast amount of continuity to them. So you won't be looking at something completely different every time. It will all kind of um, make sense when, when looking from a use to then the supplemental standards. So again, uh, with the consolidation and organization, uh, that was a big point uh, to this title here. So that, I know that was very fast, but it's a very high level review of how we've reorganized the code uh, compared to what you have today. Um, and as Roger mentioned earlier, what, you know, the, the goals were, you know, consistency, uh, a user-friendly and coherent code. And we feel that we've, we've, we've hit those marks. Uh, it's now a logical table of contents. It's reorganized. All the standards are now in tables with more illustrations and photographs. The procedures have been updated and modernized. Uh, we've checked it for conformance with state and federal law. Um, but overall, the, the core standards have not changed. Um, really too much. Uh, just overall, it's been modernized uh, with current best practices. And then we just, uh, given that we're still in the admin draft stage, we still have a few gaps um, of uh, issues we need to discuss with staff. And we kind of uh, layered them here as uh, sort of minor to major. So whether uh, we have a planning fee schedule as an appendix in the code, uh, that's a minor issue, but an, easily, an easy discussion to have with staff. And then um, we have the more major ones towards the bottom, such as telecommunications facilities. We need to make sure those standards are up to the latest FCC standards as well. And then signs. Uh, obviously, signs are a big topic that is potentially controversial in every city. Uh, but Roger is going to cover that uh, in just a second. But that's just to give you a sense of some of the, uh, the issues we have uh, going forward that uh, we need to discuss with staff. So with that. Um, Sorry if I went too fast, or uh, but uh, if you have any questions um, or comments, now's the time. Adam, by combining um, the overlay districts, Wallapai Mountain Banks, and all that, I guess is it somehow defined in there? So when someone opens it up and gets in there, they'll know. We're talking about Wallapai Mountain Road, banks, and so forth. 
Yeah, so right now I'm sure on a map, if you were looking at it, you'd have three distinct zones. They would just be, each would be the KDRO now, and they have their one set of standards. Since this, the standards today, they mirror each other pretty much completely. So th there's still overlays in that sense, but they all have the same standards. So it'll be much, much easier to administer um, on the city side. All right, thank you. Yeah, and it'll be one, one district map, if you can hear me. Yeah, so one color, so I'm gonna look at see it on the map, would be one color. And yeah. Exactly, yep, yep. And then just to clarify on that point though, um, Adam was moving pretty quickly. We didn't want to get too deep into individual sections, but we did write based on input from some of the planning commissioners and stakeholders, some general design standards that apply citywide and then we have more specific design standards, building, lot, and site standards that apply within the KDRO. Excellent. Yep. But, but uh, I just want to add one thing while, while you're thinking about this. I know we presented a lot of information there. Last night, the city council held a work session uh, discussion with us, um, very informative discussion with them. We were talking about the historic overlay district and um, our sub-consultant Carl Eberhardt from Flagstaff presented the options for expanding the historic overlay district and some approaches for writing historic preservation standards. So uh, we're going to be working with staff to figure out uh, a clearer understanding of council's direction and so when you see the public review draft, you'll see a, a different approach to historic preservation than you currently have today. Any other questions for us on the code itself? I'm good. Thank you, Roger. Good. Uh, other commissioners? No? Okay. No, thank you. So again, just, yeah, just to, just to recap then, we are, Expecting comments from staff um, in the next few days or into uh, next week. Then we'll figure out a timeline with them to respond and get the public review draft back to you. So that starting in the early fall, we'll hopefully be going to the Historic Preservation Commission, getting their buy-in and support for the Historic Overlay District and preservation standards. And then we'll be coming to the Planning Commission for the scheduled public hearings for your final recommendation to City Council towards the end of the year into into the new year. So that's that's the schedule on that. All right. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Part of it. There you go. You hopefully can see a slide that says, read the town of Gilbert, implications to the sign code. Are you ready to get a little more technical? We're good. I'm sure, I'm sure by now you've heard about Reed v. Town of Gilbert, this seminal U.S. Supreme Court case from 2015. Um, but I thought it would be helpful because you're the planning commission and you're going to be really diving into the nuts and bolts of the sign code. I thought it might be helpful just to pause for a minute and talk generally about this case because it really has changed the landscape for sign regulation. So Pastor Reed down in Gilbert had a, has a very small church, doesn't have a specific building that he uses for his Sunday church services. And for a while, and I'm not sure what the status is now, for a while he was moving from one location to another, uh, depending on where he could locate the service. And what he was doing was putting up signs like the one you see in this image here on the Saturday before his Sunday service. And this is where he ran into trouble with the city of Gilbert, or the town of Gilbert, because Gilbert had in their code 
a category of sign called a temporary directional sign relating to a qualifying event. Quite the mouthful. That that sign type was only allowed to be displayed a few hours before the event, which meant sometime overnight, which obviously wasn't very efficient at getting people to come to his church services on Sunday morning. Kind of a long story short, uh, there was enforcement action by the city. The uh, pastor appealed. Um, it landed up going through a series of courts up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court came down very hard on the town of Gilbert and said, your code is deficient because it's based on content regulations for sign. And a fundamental principle of sign regulation is that you should not be content-based. So I've simplified what that really means in this graphic based on the standards in their sign code. Ideological signs can be placed anywhere for as long as you want, and they can be 20 square feet in area. But a political sign can only be 16 square feet or 32 square feet, but then you have very different regulations on where and for how long the sign type can be placed, as you have for a temporary directional sign. And the city's or the town's argument that their regulations were intended to ensure the aesthetic values and the aesthetic principles of, of Gilbert was literally laughed at by the court because of this different set of regulations based on the message the sign conveyed. So the distinction that we're really promoting now with all new sign regulations is that they have to be content neutral. That is to say, based on time, place, or manner regulations. And what's on the sign just doesn't matter. So you describe it as a freestanding sign, or a building mounted sign, or an awning sign, or a canopy sign, or whatever as compared to a sign type based on a, the message it conveys, political, construction, real estate, or, and so on. And many, many communities across the country have had to come face to face with their codes and rewrite them based on this principle of the code regulating signs needs to be content neutral. And this is actually an interesting challenge for any city, for any community, because as you all know, the First Amendment is really near and dear to our hearts as Americans. Uh, we value freedom of speech. And election cycles exist, and so there's always going to be this demand to put out political signs. We like to put out signs proclaim, proclaiming our ideology, put out signs promoting in the lower left illustration our bicycle sale or our discount sales or whatever. And so how do you balance that First Amendment right for signage with the need to define the special character of a place and to regulate based on aesthetic principles? That's always the big challenge. And so in Kingman, our review of the code found that you have a number of existing sign types that are content-based. You can see it on the left. Real estate, construction signs, political and ideological signs, special event signs, track signs for new single-family subdivisions, and so on. In the permanent signs, home occupation signs. You shouldn't really define it as a home occupation sign. But you can see on the right-hand side, there are different ways of getting to allowing that message to be conveyed, but you define the sign type based on time, place, and manner. How long may it be out? Where may it be placed? And in what manner? How should it be designed? And so summarizing here for Kingman then, we've got a number of content-based sign types. The code organization, uh, not surprisingly, is, is not the best. It's a little hard to use. And of course, there are sign standards not just in the sign chapter or sign section. We've also got sign sections in the in standards in the existing PDD. So it makes it hard jumping around from one to the other. The illustrations were a good attempt in the day, but a little outdated by today's values. 
Most of the code includes standards in paragraphs rather than tables. And as you'll see in a moment, we prefer to try and summarize standards and tables so it's much easier to use. A lot of the standards are outdated and we're still working with staff and will be with the community, for example, on billboards to provide the most updated standards suitable for the community. The illumination standards are really out of date and don't address, for example, the new technologies in lighting with LED, uh, which is a very important thing to think about. And it lacks, and this is very important from a legal perspective, a severability and substitution clause. So severability means that if somebody chooses to challenge the sign code, the sign code can be severed from the zoning code the zoning code is still effective while whatever legal action is pursued on the sign code. It doesn't invalidate the whole zoning code. So it's a very important section of the code to, ins in, uh, to insert. And the substitution clauses are also very important following read to make sure that it's clear in the code you can substitute a commercial message for a non-commercial message and vice versa without necessarily needing a permit. So if you have a bookstore out that says Joe's books and Joe decides he wants to put up a political message, he should be able to do that without coming into the city staff to require a permit. One of the questions that I thought we might want to talk about this evening, and we'll be discussing this also with staff, is what kinds of temporary signs are appropriate in Kingman? You can see on the right, I put an image on the lower right-hand side of what we call a vertical banner sign. It's typically a fiberglass pole, sometimes up to 10 feet high, sometimes around eight, nine feet high, with any message on them. They obviously flap around in the wind. And then the upper right is a tube or wind sign. We call them the happy wavy guys. There's a little fan below and they tend to dance around in the wind. They're obviously very effective as an attention getting device. Many communities are saying no to those, but every community is different. So your perspective on those two sign types would be, would be helpful. So I popped in this slide just to give you an idea, and I know you can't read it in detail, but this is an example of how we can take pages of text for temporary signs and put them into really two simple tables. The first one on the left would just tell you general standards for temporary signs within residential zones and other zones, commercial and industrial zones. And it'll so tell you that you can have 16 square feet of total temporary signage for a, in a residential district. That 16 square feet can be made up of any type of sign and can convey any message, whether it's a political message, construction, hello, Bob, whatever ideological message somebody wants to say. And the table on the right then tells you your A-frame sign can be four square feet, four feet in height, three feet in width with a maximum area of 12 square feet. Or it can be a window sign or a yard sign or something like that. And there are the specific standards for each of those sign types Again, regardless of the message. Here are some code pages from some other codes that we've worked on. On the left is from the town of Arlington in Massachusetts. A very simple approach to integrating a graphic with a table with the standard. Um, we've done more sophisticated layouts of this. We've had more standards in the table and the graphic placed below it. Um, and we'll, again, be working with city staff to figure out the best approach from their perspective. And we look forward to presenting that to you in a couple of months. Um, just a couple of illustrations of some photographs I've taken around the country of what I think are attractive signs that we can think about as a guide to how we write and finalize the standards. These are mostly building mounted signs. These are all Arizona signs for mostly um, monument signs here. I think they're pretty attractive, but it just gives you an idea of the variety of styles that you can get in a sign, uh, as a result of the sign code. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that for now and uh, take any questions on the sign code from you. <clears throat> Yep. 
make sure you really understand the principles behind read so that when you see the draft, you can understand the direction we've taken. Nobody? Very, very good. Wow, y'all are you all are quiet and shy. I'm I'm used to just being barraged with questions. <laughs> well, good. Um, so nothing nothing on signs. We can move on. Wait till the final draft comes, Roger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll be prepared. I've still got my motorcycle helmet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Um, so, as I think you know, we are uh, tasked to introduce form-based codes into Kingman. And Sylvia, I forget when you did this, but I believe it was a little over a year ago. You did a presentation to either the Planning Commission or the City Council on form-based codes. Um, and I just thought it would be important, again, as the Planning Commission making a recommendation to Council that we take a little time to just make sure you understand what we're trying to achieve, because this is really important for downtown Kingman and potentially elsewhere in the community as the community evolves. Um, and so I wanted to just pause and talk about form-based codes. So let's start with a, a simple premise. This is a typical well-intentioned policy statement that you might see in any city's general plan or um, comprehensive plan. So I think you can all get behind that, right? Infill and develop within existing urbanized areas and build affordable multifamily housing near a transportation corridor. And so we can think about what that really looks like, right? And we get this vision of multifamily housing, it's mixed use, it's in an urbanized area on a transportation corridor, has a level of affordability, there's active streets, there's parking on the street. But what our zoning codes will often do is a result in that. And the point I'm making here is that while this is not necessarily bad, does it really meet the intention of that policy statement? Policy statements, of course, are broad and general, and they rely on the zoning code to implement them. So why? Why would our zoning codes not allow us to implement what we really want? And it goes back now to really the fact that while we as a community of, of planners and many citizens really dislike sprawl now, and we understand that sprawl is expensive, it's polluting, it runs up costs, builders aren't violating the rules when they build housing developments on the edge of a community. They're building exactly what the code calls for. And why do we have the codes that they're building towards? Well, let's go back over a hundred years to the industrial revolution and prior to zoning, where you had factories like you see Chicago in the top right image, somewhere on the East Coast, the lower left image, and you had factories and people living within very close proximity to each other in really intolerable housing conditions. It led to all sorts of acts the Tenement Act in New York in 1910 or whatever it was. New York City adopted zoning in 1916. And ultimately, it was the State Enabling Acts of the 1920s. And eventually, the Euclid case, Euclid versus Embler Realty, that said, wait a minute, you can legally legislate cities and towns that you can separate people from industrial uses, from manufacturing uses. Public safety, public health, welfare, and safety is important. Therefore, you can regulate the ownership of land to make sure that you put residences away from factories. So we landed up with sprawl because we got really good at it. 
And we realized that we could separate all of these uses, residential, commercial, industrial, and spread them out across the landscape. And this tied in with the evolution of the automobile after World War II, the expansion of the interstate freeway, and bigger, wider roads, more cars, faster cars, and we just tended to make our cities grow. And the zoning tools we used that was based on the 1920s State Enabling Acts were use-based codes of zoning maps. This is actually in Las Vegas, but the Kingman zoning map is very similar. Established very distinct pods of uses, yellow for single-family residential, orange for higher density, multifamily residential, red typically commercial, blue industrial, green parks. And we consciously separated uses. And we used tools like density, and floor area ratio and lot coverage to regulate the use on these um, in these zones. And this really obviously led to very much suburban developments because that was the nature of the codes we as planners were writing. And this is what happened on the ground. Again, this is um, northern Las Vegas, uh, the same area from the zoning map before. And you can see the pods of development, the very large commercial um, big box stores here, the single family residential developments, the multifamily developments, pods of uses connected by a street infrastructure. And this is an interesting picture because on the upper left is Levittown, um, New York, and on the right, very similar forms, single family homes all neatly tucked in next to each other, grid like streets, which is good. The commercial development, the big box stores, separated by some kind of open space or green space, and some attempt to connect from the residential use into the commercial use, because without that, you're going to be driving who knows how many miles around the corner to get to that particular store. It's unfortunate, of course, that the walkway takes you into the back where the loading and unloading docks are, and it's not a particularly walkable place. So the result was, while we separated uses, we spent more time in our cars. So why does this matter? Well, it depends on the kind of place that we want to create. And there really is still a place for, on the left, the automotive-driven type of suburban development, uh, North Stockton Road, uh, Andy Devine, very much automobile-centered development based on the zoning that's in place, and we're not suggesting that needs to change unless the city actively chooses to do so. But if you want a place that's more walkable, then you need to establish a set of zoning tools uh, that allow you to do that. And so in this illustration on the right, you can see they've taken that old shopping center and started to show how it might be redesigned it's a more walkable place with more emphasis on people and bikes and less emphasis on automobiles moving through there. Part of this, of course, is that under our current zoning system, red on the zoning map could mean the Target store and the other big box stores on the left, or a really walkable main street like you see on the right. Or, and this should be familiar to you, downtown Kingman. These two places, on the left and on the right, have the same zoning, but they have a very different form. And that's the whole point here. We've got to start thinking about how to write a code to create the type of place that we want. If we're okay with a suburban strip development along a major arterial, we've got our use based codes to do that. If we want to create a more walkable, mixed-use, more pedestrian-scaled environment, now we need a different tool, hence the form-based code. And you can see the standard definition here from the Form-Based Code Institute. Uh, Lisa is a past chair of the Form-Based Code Institute. I'm a past um, vice chair. We're both selective on the steering committee for Form-Based Code Institute. And what a form-based code does is it fosters this predictability that you lack in a conventional code, a high-quality built environment by focusing instead of use first, 
focusing on regulating land development based on form. That is to say, the relationship of buildings to buildings and buildings to the street. Use is important, but not the primary driver of the code. And so you can see on the right-hand side of this slide an existing street and how that street was transformed through the application of a form-based code. So stating the same thing somewhat graphically, your conventional code or Euclidean code is driven mostly by use and density, form, lot coverage, or height, or setbacks are lower values in, to, in the determinants of, of the code. Management, of course, is important. Somebody has to manage and administer the code. In a form-based code, you flip it around. Management is still in the middle there. Use is regulated, but not as important. It's form that is most important. So, a form-based code regulates typically public and private space. They're well illustrated, they're very transparent, they're very predictable, and they're often, not always, but often driven and based on a charrette process that involves the public because they will, might be applied, for example, in a whole community or a greenfield development where something's being built from scratch. The conventional zoning code really only regulates private space. The street standards are all in the engineering code. They're often based on metrics and they're often very text heavy. The five main elements of a form-based code, not all of which are gonna be in the Kingman code, just to, to talk about right up front. You're gonna have what we call a regulating plan. It's like a zoning map. And I'll talk about how it's different to the zoning map um, in a minute, because you've got to show what types of form, what types of places you want on some kind of a map. There may or may not be public standards in the form-based code. For example, standards dealing with street widths on street parking, street trees, sidewalk widths, and so on. Um, there may be building standards that really talk about the controlling features and functions of the building. So this might be, for example, the frontage standards. What does the front of the building look like and how does it engage with the street? If it's a residential form, does it have a porch or a stoop? If it's a commercial space, is it a shop front like you have many of them in downtown today? Or is it an arcade or a, or a gallery? Then you have your administrative functions, and then finally, of course, your definitions. So the way the form-based code is organized is based on this thing called a transect. And hopefully you'll recognize the mountain peak in the background there. And if any of you have been to, to the top of, of those mountains just outside Kingman, you'll know that there's pine trees up there, ponderosa pine trees. And as you come down from the mountain, the vegetation changes as you come back down into the desert. And that is what I've loosely described or roughly described as an ecological transect. As you change elevation and you change temperature, you change soil type, you change the vegetation. And so you, you have different places, different characters from the top of the mountain down into the desert. Well, you can do the same thing across a city. You can establish your most natural zone where the least development is on the periphery of the city. You might have some rural areas where you'd have agricultural uses, for example. Then you might have a T3, transect zone three, suburban or single family residential type zone, up to the downtown core, the urban core zone, with different levels of urban intensity in between. So what we've done is we've created this um, transect of most natural to most urban based on the character of the place in between. We've been working in Las Vegas, as you may know, and we've created a transect for Las Vegas, illustrated on the right, from downtown. Um, you can actually see the Fremont Street experience down in here in some of the downtown casinos and the intensity of the form of downtown and then as you go through transect zone T5 to T4 to T3 out into the desert, you can see how the urban form starts to get smaller, 
less dense, less intense as you move out to the desert. And this is the East Tremont District regulating plan or essentially zoning map showing the different transect zones that we created. Whoops, all right. So what's important then about the form-based code is it really thinks about that interface between public and private space the front of the building and the relationship of the building to the street. Now, I'm going through this fairly quickly. We, we do a whole slideshow and, and class just on this one image, but it's just important to understand that relationship in the code. So if we look at the transit zones that we've created for Kingman, and right now we're only applying them in the downtown area, we created a T5 Main Street zone that would take the place of the C3, your existing C3 zone, um, along Route 66. The downtown area itself, which is mostly C2, uh, general commercial, would be the T5 general zone. And then the R2 zone, which is uh, slightly higher intensity residential, would allow for the new T4 neighborhood. And then the existing house scale buildings that are either attached or detached would be the T3 neighborhood, R16. And so you can see how that gets mapped here on the zone that was helped uh, cre created for us by the city staff. T5 Main Street along uh, Route 66, T5 General in the core of downtown, T4 neighborhood. And if you're familiar with this area, you'll know the form of the buildings here is slightly different than up on the hill here in the T3 neighborhood. And then you've got a lot of civic buildings, City Hall right here, other city buildings, the county courthouse and so on. Home base codes typically don't regulate them, which is why they're not in the transit zone. And then these illustrations here show you the typical standards for building placement on the left. I, I know they're a little small. I just wanted to give you a high level understanding of just like in the conventional zones, the zones are in the columns to the right and then the individual standards are on the left. And then on the right hand side, we address uses. And this is actually an open question we're still working through with the city staff because we realized that actually most of the uses in T5 Main Street, T5 General, uh, T4 Neighborhood and T3 Neighborhood actually worked from their original zones, C3, C2, um, R2, and R16. Except that we listed the uses that we don't want to allow. Because that, I think you would agree with me that an equipment rental yard is probably not an appropriate use in your downtown. Likewise, a vehicle towing impound yard might work elsewhere in the community, but downtown, in a walkable place, you probably don't want to have that. So the question then is, and now we're going to get a little nerdy, do we want to keep the form-based code as an overlay and therefore um, it's only applied when a property owner really wants to, to develop their property uh, under the code? So they have the base zoning plus the transect zone and they pick one or the other. Or do we say, okay, let's bite the bullet and let's say within this downtown area, these are the transect zones. The standards are the same as we have before because they actually work, but these uses are no longer be allowed. Why is this important? You might remember Proposition 207. Going back to um, 2005, when the state, uh, through, uh, when was it, the election of November 2005, yes. Um, Proposition 207 was, was passed, and that meant that if a city or town enacts a more restrictive land use law, then the property owner may file for compensation, saying that because of the more restrictive land use law, they have the, the city has devalued their property. So would somebody make an argument that because they can't do a vehicle towing yard in downtown, now opens the city up to a Proposition 207 claim. That's a policy decision and a legal decision for the city to make. Um, there are opportunities for the city to issue waivers if that's the, the route they would like to go. Um, but that's certainly a, a topic for future discussion. 
All right, some examples from the code of frontage standards. Uh, on the left, a gallery. On the right, a projecting porch. So you can see the heavy graphic nature of the code, the simple standards presented in tables to make it easy to use. We also include civic space standards. Um, in this instance, I gave you examples of a pocket park or playground. Uh, in an admin draft, we didn't illustrate these, but we will in the public review draft. And so what we also said was that the civic space standards and these frontage standards could be applied not only within the form-based code area, but they could also be applied elsewhere um, within the city. So if somebody in a PD, for example, um, wants to do a cool development and wants to build a pocket park or a plaza of some type, there are at least standards now in the zoning code that can be applied within that new development. Uh, Adam, I think I'll just keep cruising here because we're almost at the end. There are a lot of misconceptions about form-based codes that sometimes give them a bad name. And they're, they're listed here, and I know this is a little odd because it tends to focus more on the negative, that one of the misconceptions is that form-based codes do not regulate use. Well, they do. It's not the primary purpose of the code, the form, the relationship of buildings to buildings and buildings to street, that public space is most important you do have to regulate use. You don't always want a medical marijuana dispensary in your downtown. You may not want to have somebody living above a bar that's open until two o'clock in the morning. So some use control is important. Form based codes are not necessarily complicated. I've honestly seen far more comprehensive complicated conventional codes. The graphics, the simple tables tend to make form based codes a lot more a lot easier to use. They get this reputation, I think, because they're more comprehensive in many ways. By now, form-based codes are tested. There's over 600 in the country. They are standards. They're actually baked into the zoning code as standards, so they have the same weight as any other standard in the zoning code. They're always customized to a community. We don't just use them as boilerplates. The structure might be very similar, but the standards are unique to Kingman or Las Vegas or downtown uh, Los Angeles. They don't typically regulate architecture at all. Uh, private developments might. The ION project in North Carolina or the Seaside project in Florida, for example, their privately developed projects have very strict architectural rules, but city applied form-based codes do not typically include any architectural standards. They don't necessarily apply to new development like Greenfields. They can apply, for example, in downtown Las Vegas as much as they would in downtown Kingman. Staff are always a part of any process of writing the code and administering the code, making sure that the applicant applies the standards based on the code. And they don't necessarily result in high density development or upzoning. And at risk of repeating myself here, form-based code have many benefits. Um, their predictability is probably one of the most important parts of this. They're certainly easier to use and richly illustrated. And over the years, we found that form-based codes do provide economic developments. And it's my understanding that Kingman would very much like to see greater investment in downtown. We, we heard this from one of the council members last night. And if you write a code and allow for people to start living in downtown and in finding some way to incentivize it. Um, you can actually start getting people spending more time in downtown, which will be a huge benefit to the local businesses in downtown. So it's been an absolute pleasure talking about all of this with you. Adam and I are available, Mr. Chairman, for any questions. And um, look forward to any further discussion Comments from you all. Roger, um, is it easy to mesh the downtown historic overlay with form based as the pictures um, you showed without a game? Yes, actually. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that, that's a really good question, and it, it came up last evening. 
when we were talking about the historic overlay district with the um, city council, the vice mayor brought up a very similar question. And I think there's a lot of benefit here to combining the boundary of the form based code area with the boundary of the historic overlay district. Because those two tools working together can really give you a lot of bang for your buck. It can help, for example, the, the Beale Hotel find the tools to, um, and the investment to bring that building around. Now, whether it comes back as a hotel, whether you just maintain the structure and use it for some other use, completely unknown. But the tool of the phone based code and the historic preservation standards supporting it uh, I think would be a huge benefit for, for downtown Kingdom. The same would apply more further out on the periphery where you've got some beautiful little buildings that could be protected both through the historic preservation standards and the form of the form based code. Because today with your C3 zoning, what's to stop somebody just taking down some of those buildings and putting up a building that would be allowed under the C3 or C2 zone? I think that would not be in the best interests of downtown. But you know, that's obviously a decision you, as the planning commission, will have to think about and present to the city council. And then I guess the other question would be, since we do already have uh, rental yards down here, automobile paint shops, how would the city determine the cost? If say we gave you give a time limit, uh, um, if we were to decide to change the coding down here, how does how would the city determine the cost um, if we wanted to go that route on the on the the two hundred seven? Well, Mr. Chairman, as I understand it, and and I'm not an attorney, but but based on what I'm familiar with with my years in the state here, if somebody feels aggrieved by the decision to say in the downtown area, I can't do this use or that use. It's the property owner who has to do the valuation and has to prove that there's been a diminution in economic value of the property. The city may have to incur, you know, legal costs to either do their own valuation and, you know, provide a counterclaim. Or as I noted before, the city could say, okay, we hear you under the Proposition 207 statute, it's Title 13 something, we can grant you a claim, a waiver of um, the new code and you would be grandfathered under the old code. So you land up with, as Carl mentioned yesterday to the council, a bit of a Swiss cheese where you've got, you know, a uniform set of standards, but one person has filed a claim and is exempt from the form based code standard. So it comes down now to an element of risk and just how much opportunity do you think there is for somebody to file the claim? They have, if I remember correctly, um, and again, your city attorney will guide you on this. I think it's three years from the date that the ordinance is adopted to file the claim. So, you know, Flagstaff did it with the um, townside overlay district. Three years came and went, nobody filed a claim. And now, you know, the historic overlay district that was applied there is the law and people are com 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 uh, compiling, uh, complying with it. And as a result, there's a lot more active historic preservation in that area of downtown. And it's been very, very cool to observe. Does that answer that for you, sir? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions from Members of the commission, staff. Oh, this 
probably probably right. what this looks like, Roger. Okay. So just just the, the last slide then, just to kind of wrap up here. Um, here we are with the red line in, in early June. Uh, expecting staff comments here pretty soon. And then um, somewhere around the end of August, September, releasing the public review draft, and then starting the process with Historic uh, Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, Planning Commission, and eventually City Council. So a lot more public outreach needs to be done by city staff at this point. Uh, we'll be working very closely with Chris and Gary and Rich and Sylvia um, and other staff is needed as um, we start taking this a lot more public now. So it's been a pleasure spending the evening with you. Uh, if any of you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to Adam and or I. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to help. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Roger. You'll have to, yeah, you'll have to do the announcements and stuff. All right. Item limited to announcements, availability, or attendance at conferences and seminars, requests for agenda items for future meetings, and requests for reports from staff. No discussion on any of these items. Any, any commission members have any announcements? I see none. I need to make a need a motion for adjournment. I'll motion to adjourn. I have a motion. I need a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>